Hey guys, great to see everybody. Uh, it's always my favorite time of year coming here and it means it's football season and getting ready to get started again. Uh, it's been a great off season uh, for our football program um, coming off of last year, correcting some mistakes uh, in the spring and getting ready to get 25 more practices to continue instituting a new offensive scheme, a simplified defensive scheme, and continue great special teams effort. I've got uh, two uh, tremendous football players here today as well as tremendous people. Uh, and Michael Pittman, uh, our wide receiver, and Christian Rector, uh, our defensive end. Um, and with that, I'll answer any questions that you have. Everyone's got a lot of football questions, but first I wanted to lead off with uh, Austin Jackson and his mm -hmm. whole situation. Mm -hmm. How has the team sort of come to his side and supported him through donating uh, bone marrow to his sister? Yeah, what a great story Austin Jackson is. Um, you know, his sister Autumn uh, needed a bone marrow transplant and uh, to be a perfect match for her and have that opportunity to help her get healthy um, was just a blessing from God. That's, that's what it is. Um, and uh, we're so glad that Austin got that opportunity over the summer to be able to do that. He's recovering from it right now. He's back with us uh, at school. And uh, I know he's looking forward to uh, uh, not only his recovery, but most importantly, his uh, sister's. Um, right now, he's training to get in uh, the best football shape possible. Um, we'll see where he is at the start of training camp. Um, and, and we've been through this scenario before. If you were uh, with guys that had been out of football for a little bit, you remember Adoree had been um, out with track, and we kind of eased him along uh, in his Thorpe Award winning season uh, to where you know it was a little bit slower pace. We'll see where Austin is uh, come next week. Uh, with it and uh, and then go from there, but we won't put him fully in until we know he's 100%. Clay, could you walk us through the additions of Chris Steele and Drew McCoy from, from your perspective and how that all unfolded? Yeah, you know, I, I think one of the most important things and one of the things my dad has always taught me is how important relationships are and, and to never burn bridges. Um, you know, gentlemen make decisions and people make decisions in life and, and you honor that decision and you support that decision and know you're always there for them. Um, and, you know, uh, we're very fortunate to have great relationships with Brew and with Chris, and they have a special place in their heart for USC and, and what it can, uh, what they can do for our team, and what USC can do for them. And uh, have the opportunity to welcome both those men uh, into our program, and, and them be uh, will be major contributors uh, for us uh, in the future uh, is a special thing. So uh, probably the biggest thing I learned from it is is how important relationships are and trust is. What's the kind of the timetable for each of them? What do you think? Um, you know, right now, Dan, we're going through the waiver process with the NCAA as far as um, uh, whether they'll be eligible to play or not. Uh, it's not been finalized. I don't have a timetable for it because it's not on our, our – it's an NCAA decision. Uh, hopefully we'll know something before game one. Uh, I anticipate that. Um, but uh, we're in that process right now. Is it the same process for both? Uh, yes, it, it's it basically you supply a waiver to the NCAA and they make they make a decision uh, on it. What was your immediate reaction regarding Brew's decision on portal and wants to come back? you know, um, I, I've known Brew for, and his family for a long time. Um, they, heck, we live about three miles apart, uh, to be honest with you. And and. Um, what a fabulous gentleman and what a fabulous family. And everybody's story is different. And this transfer portal that we've had, uh, that's the one thing that going into it, I realized that each story in each case is going to be different. And you're dealing with 18 to 21-year-olds that uh, have situations in their life that that they need to figure out for themselves what's best for them. And, and that takes time. And the greatest gift we can give somebody is our time. Uh, and to help them through the process, to guide them, um, and to support them. And if you do that, if you do that, that relationship stays intact. And, you know, um, Brew and I have, have had a great relationship for many years. Uh, and when he came back, it didn't surprise me. 
because I know how special USC is to him. I know how, how special being in Los Angeles, California is for him. Um, and, you know, I, I welcome him back with open arms and glad he's with us. What kind of sales pitch did it require with Chris? Because he obviously had decommitted and <clears throat> had a few chances and kept choosing other places and ultimately ends up back up here. What mm -hmm. did you say to kind of get him on board with that? Um, just, just the same thing that I, I felt and believed in that we had a unique opportunity for him, um, and and once that opportunity came to fruition, that we had an opening uh, that. Uh, that I, I truly believed it was a great opportunity for him, that uh, not only on the field but off. Uh, you know, Chris Chris is a great student athlete, uh, and I know how important education was to him. And I also thought the timing was, was great for him, especially when you look at the players that we were losing off of last year's team, the opportunity to compete. Uh, in a hurry uh, and, and see where he's at. Um, I, I thought it would be unique to him and a great timing for him. And he saw the same thing. And he's another kid that has always had the USC, has been a special place in his heart. Obviously, his family's right from here. Uh, mom and dad is right here. Uh, and he, he's, always, he's always been ultra respectful uh, to myself, our staff. And, and when he came back, it was just, it felt natural and comfortable to him that it was the right time and the right place for him. I'm glad for him. When people ask you, how is this team? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I, the one thing going into it, I, I, I thought that uh, I reminded myself that people are, they're 18 to 21 years old, and each story is different. Um, you take Valus Jones, for instance. Valus has got a family situation at home with a grandfather in the ICU, I, you know, and how much he loves his family and, and how a hard time it was for his family. Uh, and he needed to figure things out for himself and see what was best for him. And at the end of the day, came to to to... Uh, agree with that, you know, USC and getting his degree and being here with his brothers and playing for his brothers uh, was important to him and what what he wanted. And and he got the blessing of his family and uh, and it was great. Uh, and then there's other situations that young men get a degree and and they want to garner a, a, a bigger role and a grander experience. And and uh, and I welcome that. I ask them to do one thing, get their degree. Uh, and so I think each case is different and the greatest gift you can give somebody is your time And I felt like going in knowing that there would be a ton of people put their name in the transfer portal I think we were over 2,500 for about 300 spots that you were going to need to help young men And that's part of our job as coaches is to be able to guide and teach and help young people um, yeah, when People ask you how is this year going to be different in terms of like a bullet point? <clears throat> This way, this way, how is this year going to be different for you guys? If I had to say it in one word, Dan, I'd say accountability. Accountability to each other, accountability to our fundamentals, accountability to protecting the ball, taking the ball away, and the accountability of not having penalties. Um, those are the things that cost us games last year. So if there's one word, uh, I would say accountability. With the transfer portal, uh, Davis and Matt Fink both came back. What's your policy on guys who enter and their ability to return? Mm -hmm. Well, I, like I said, I said each case is different, um, and there's certain situations that when a, when a player leaves, it's, it's it might be best for him, uh, and you know had that discussion with him that hey, if we choose to go this, we, we are I'm going to help you in any way I can find help you find the right place, but it's your opportunity to have the chance to find the best place for you and, and we'll find the next opportunity for somebody to fill that role. Um, and then there's situations that I think kids need time. And there were some kids on our football team that needed time and I wanted to make sure I granted that. So um, I didn't just lay down a hard line rule of, oh, if, if you put your name in the portal, you're not a Trojan. Um, e each case was different and I wanted to help each kid. You touched on Austin Jackson. Yes. Um, you know, initially, I, I'll get the final injury report as of next week. Um, you know, we, we have a couple kids that are, are coming off surgery. That'll be right really close by. Um, you, you know, uh, uh, Matt Fink is, is coming off a minor knee surgery that he, he should be he should be ready by the time of camp. It'll be really, really close. Um, uh, and a couple kids with a couple calf bowls and things. Uh, I'll have a better uh, idea for you. We still got, you know, basically another week worth of rehab. And uh, a week's time, a lot of things can happen. So I don't want to give you anything false. Clay, what were the discussions with Daniel Matarebe 
Um, Daniel is doing well. Uh, Daniel is this year going to focus on finalizing his um, master's degree as well as continuing to train. Uh, but he's doing well. He won't he won't be with us this season, uh, but uh, is doing well. Could he come back? Um, I look forward to watching him play in the 2020 season. I really do. Somewhere. Has the door completely closed on you, Kelly Um Right now, you, you know, YK is in the transfer portal right now, um, and uh, we'll see where that goes. Uh, we'll see where that goes. Um, uh, YK is finding out what's the best situation for him, and we're doing the same. Can you address the guys in the class who didn't make it, Jalen Watson, Tony, Luke, Eli, and then Trey Davis now in the portal? Say one more time. Can you address the guys in the 19 class who didn't make it to Kansas and what happened to the situations? Uh, you, you said some names. Can you go through them again? Jalen Watson, uh, Levi, yeah. and then Trey Davis now. Yeah, um, Trey has a family situation back at home um, that uh, he put his name in the portal uh, to, that he may need to garner a better opportunity closer to home. Um, and then um, uh, Jalen is uh, Jalen fell just short of eligibility requirements for transfer regulations. Uh, Talini? Yeah. Uh, Talini fell just short of eligibility requirements also. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you know, the, the, probably the most important thing as a leader is that when you have good seasons like a Rose Bowl year and a Pac-12 championship year, that, um, that you give the accolades to the people that are around you that got you there. And when you have a five and seven season, that you own it and you own it yourself as the leader. Um, and you look at yourself truthfully of what you have to do to get better. You can either hide your head in the sand or you can address the issues, have very brutally honest conversations with the men around you of how to get better um, and, and institute that. Um, and that, that was the biggest thing, to, to address issues, um, to make changes that needed to be changed, um, to put a point of emphasis on some things that I felt beat us last year, make those corrections, and now move on to the 2019 season. You've talked a lot about being authentic to, to yourself and you mm-hmm. said- Mm-hmm. Well, what was that like doing that and did it feel yeah. right to you? Well, it, it, it was important for our football team to understand how we got beat, especially down the stretch in those last four games by seven points or less uh, in each one of those games. It was nothing uh, that an opponent did. We beat ourselves. You know, when you turn the ball over two times in the red zone at Cal and two times in the red zone at Notre Dame, you have critical penalties down the stretch. Um, you don't acquire turnovers. Um, we did some things with lack of fundamentals that, that make you just uh, an average football team rather than what you can become. Um, and for me, that's where I, I, that's my job. Um, and that's what I told myself going in, that I'm going to hire the best coordinators that fit what we want to do offensively, defensively, and special teams, and I'm going to focus on what wins football games. And I'm going to have a passion towards that. I'm going to make sure our players feel that. Um, Because when they feel it, they know there's a sense of urgency and importance, and it's demanded of them. So, yes, the the heat got turned up a little bit in in the spring, um, and I felt it was necessary. Uh, I thought our kids thrived off of it. I thought they enjoyed it. And at the end of the day, kids love to be coached, and they love to be coached hard. And I I know your dad's a big kind of voice for Mm -hmm. you in terms of bouncing ideas off of that stuff. After you went through what you did last season, is there anybody else you talked to? No. Um, you know, I, I, I talked to other coaches, especially going through the hiring process. And one, of the, some of the best advice I got, I, you know, I, the first hire, you know, with Cliff was such a, had to have a sense of urgency because of the early signing period. Um, but the other thing that that came about in, in hiring Graham, Graham was always at the top of, of my list. But to have the availability, to not have the rush because we had about 90% of our class signed, and really be able to talk to some other people, both college and pro, there was so much that I learned personally 
um, as a coach um, and being able to acquire a tool or two from each and every guy that I talked to. And that was some of the best recommendation that I got was take your time in the process. Um, don't worry about, oh, everybody wants to know who it is right now. Um, learn from other people. Heck, you may be playing against them one day and be able to garner garner a, a tool or two. Um, and, and that whole process, I got a lot out of. Uh, some of the best advice I was given is don't worry about popular opinion. Do what you believe in and then take the time to go through the process and get the, not only the right guy, but to learn a lot of valuable material along the way. What do you learn from Graham? What has Graham taught you mm -hmm. since he's been here? Um, how simple college football can be. Um, and that it's um, that we all have grand ideas and grand schemes, but it's not what we know as coaches. It's what our players know. And to be able to see a Devin Williams, as everybody saw in spring, really come alive within the system, to be able to see kids like Amon Ra and Michael Pittman bounce from outside receiver to inside receiver, to learn conceptually, um, it, it's – it's more about the kids mastering their craft than, than you trying to outthink your opponent. Um, it's about them having great fundamentals and technique. Um, so I, I think the greatest thing that he's shown me is, is how simple the game can be uh, for the student athlete and focus on him getting better fundamentally and technique wise rather than trying to out trick somebody. Along those lines, you obviously talked to him about his philosophy in the process, mm -hmm. but going through the spring scene, was there anything specific that surprised yeah, really two things. Um, uh, one, I was very appreciative in Graham, and it was one of the things that I saw. You could see it in the stat sheets uh, when you come out of North Texas. You see them rushing the ball 2,000 yards and then having a top-10 quarterback. Um, and I, when you watch the tape, he was Graham takes what the defense gives him. If you're going to line up and load the box, he's going to throw it 60 times. And, and if you end up dropping eight and playing cover two, he's not going to force a pass. He's going to run the ball and let a rusher get 200 yards in a game. You know, and to be able to see him not script, to just play call and train himself during the spring was a unique tool that I really enjoyed. And, and Clancy did it too, where we would just script the personnel groupings and let them call the plays based on the situation. Played a lot of situational football. I thought it got not only our players better, but it made both play callers better. So those are probably the two things uh, that, that I saw coming out of spring that I enjoyed. Is there a good anecdote or example that speaks to how that heightened accountability has been kind of bought into? <laughs> yeah, you, you know, I, I, as I thought one of the most important hires any head coach can make is their strength and conditioning coach. And um, – Probably the most important hire, to be honest with you. Um, we lost a good man in Ivan Lewis going to the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, but to, to garner Aaron Osmus, who has run two SEC programs, has been at SC and run this program, um, and also the, the crew that he brought in, the assistant coaches that he brought in underneath him, had led college programs. And to see that, that commitment to accountability in their group, it has been – there's nowhere to hide. You know, the, the, every day, whether you're in the strength and conditioning, whether you're with our coaches, everybody's accountable. And uh, it's been really neat to see Aaron and his group lead our program uh, May through this point in time right now. It's been a, it's been a really a special time for us. It's been a great summer. And uh, I can't wait to see the dividends for this fall. What was that conversation with Aaron like? Because he's been out of coaching for – Four or five yeah. years almost. What yeah. was that conversation like when you approached him about the job? Uh, just uh, true joy. You know, anytime, and, and, and it wasn't what's, what people, uh, I, don't, I don't think he minds me saying this. Um, Aaron Osmus loves his sons, and he wasn't living, leaving Los Angeles, California for any job and leaving his sons, and uh, um, had turned down many jobs and found, found a job in strength and conditioning that uh, allowed him to still be in the field. Uh, but be in the equipment side. And then the opportunity, but he's always been a teacher at heart. And to have the opportunity to teach again and to see his enthusiasm and to see his energy and the guys that he's brought in, that a lot of times when you hire assist assistants, sometimes there's guessing game because you don't get to see him coach. He got to go to those places while in the equipment business and be able to watch those guys train. There was no guessing game. So he, he brought in guys that are truly studs in their profession. Um, and just to see his joy of coaching again after that break, um, it, you could see there's a definite appreciation to what he gets to do on a daily basis. Was there a specific 
specific time last season when you thought, I need to change up the offense? And and at what point did you think, I mean, because we went from a, probably a pro offense, I guess, well, to I, more of, is this a duck and chuck? Uh, I can't remember. <laughs> one of those. But anyways, was there a point in the season mm -hmm. where you said, I need to change things? Well, one of the things that uh, – there was two situations that stood out to me. One was when I got to call the game at Notre Dame towards the end of the season and to see, um, you know, in that game plan, we kept it extremely simple and to see the effectiveness of the quarterback uh, in that game. I think he was like 29 and 32 in the first half. And, and it, it really made me feel like, wow, to be able to spread the field and use all our weapons to try to keep it as simple as possible, I think I know this is the direction that we need to go. The other thing that I wanted to be able to do is I knew we would be a younger team and there's special athletes like a Devin Williams that's on our team um, that, and, and freshmen. We always get very talented freshmen. Um, and Ross St. Brown is another one that I wanted to have the availability to have the offense simple enough where a freshman could come in and really contribute at an early, at an early time period. Um, and to be able to watch this system in the spring, it's exactly what I wanted. Kids picked it up. Uh, w within three, four practices, and we're ready to go with it. Um, and, and so those are probably the two situations, just one, having a chance to call a game and be able to see where we could take the offense. Uh, and then two, you know, seeing that uh, I didn't want any confusion or hesitation from from our skilled athletes and that allowed Devin Williams and kids like himself to really thrive and not be confused, not have hesitation, uh, but to be able to take the brain out of the process and just let the talent prevail. And this is, are we doing the air raid? Is there a specific name for this? <laughs> I, shock, I, I, I don't think it is the air raid, to be honest with you. I, you know, I've watched college football and how it's changing. <clears throat> and, it, you know, you look at the teams like Oklahoma, uh, you look at the teams like Alabama <clears throat> that have had specific MOs and now have spread the field more. It's not necessarily taking the run away. You know, it, it's not throwing the ball 80 times in a game. It's more taking what the defense gives you. We got a tremendous um, advantage, in my opinion, in the college football game because of where our hash marks are. And to be able to attack every inch of the field, whether it's vertically, horizontally, in between the tackles with the run game, it's very, very important to be able to use all your skilled players and not combine them in a box. Um, and you've seen teams, uh, the best teams in the country, start to spread out and use that field and use their athletes. And, uh, and they've proven that they can win national championships. Clay, you've uh, made a lot of changes. Mm -hmm. Most of them look pretty positive. Mm -hmm. But you made a change with the media for like Tuesday and Wednesday practices, mm -hmm. reducing to stretching and then answering questions mm -hmm. afterwards. Mm -hmm. What was your thought process in yeah, keeping I, uh, the media out? You know, we, we had one, not keeping the media out. You know, I still, we, we've always had a great relationship with the media and always want to be able to help you do your job at all times. And that's why we uh, allow, uh, we do do media Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday, and provide two days to be at practice for, for 30 minutes. Um, you, you know, we, we're ahead of every other, I think, standard practice in college football. We want to continue to be allowed to have the media do their job. Um, but it was something that we felt uh, in postseason play worked very well for us, uh, and we wanted to go to, I wanted to go to. Um, if there's any special request, I'll always, as you've seen in our relationship, I'll always be available for you, always. Um, but I, I want uh, our student athletes to be able to concentrate on their job job and focus on their job uh, when it's time for them to work. And uh, we'll always make access to our media. It's always been a great relationship and we'll continue to. And we'll always make Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Saturday available five out of the seven days a week. Uh, we, we work with our media uh, relationship. Thank you. Going back to accountability and discipline, did you solicit any information from your uh, returning players about what they felt was lacking last year or things they noticed that were perhaps in the end? Yeah, you, you know, we had hard conversations. That was part of, of um, the process. You always do exit interviews with your 
with your seniors uh, and being able to garner information. And, and uh, you, you know, it's not always great information, but it's the information that's needed uh, for you to improve. And again, you can either do one of two things. You can either pretend like everything's great and put your head in the sand, or you can try to become the best team in the country and be willing to make the changes that are needed and don't have feelings. You know, that's the one thing I hope you've learned from me. I don't have a lot of feelings when it comes to the game. I just want our team to be the most successful it can be. Um, and whether it's me improving in some areas, um, whether it's our team improving in some areas, uh, not only do I listen, but the things that I, I know will help us, I, I'll institute. And that's what I've done in this off season. No, I, you know one of the th one of the things um, that I think all great relationships do. If you love somebody, you tell them the truth, and, and you tell them the hard truth sometimes. And um, um, the one thing that I've always had here over my ten years here is great relationships with our players, and um, and I've always told them, I'm, uh, to be honest and to be truthful with you means I love you, and I've asked for them the same in return. You know, if you have a care and concern for myself, my family, you know, tell me. And that's why, you know, I've always had an open door policy. Guys will always come in my office. They'll always speak their mind, and we'll work it out. And that's that's why you see we do have great relationships. USC's great teams have been teams that people didn't want to play. All right, we've got about two minutes remaining with USC, and then all student athletes and coaches from the South Division will be available for additional one-on-one -on -one outside. For USC to be the team that people don't want to play. That, that you just mm -hmm. go out there. And I'm going to put a, I'm a no-line coach's son, so I, I, I believe big men win championships. And I, I think that um, um, obviously skilled players can put points on the board, but at the end of the day, I truly believe the offensive line and defensive line control uh, games. Um, and, you know, one of the things I'm very excited about, Dan, uh, this is the first time in a few years I really feel like offensively, our offensive line has showed tremendous leadership. Um, uh, the Austin Jacksons, the Jalen McKenzie of the world, Andrew Voorhees of the world, uh, even Elijah Vera Tucker has come out of his shell in this offseason. This is the group that really have been waiting to watch them grow up, uh, and now they're in their third year, and you can see their confidence um, and them controlling the offense. And then probably the, the strongest group on our defense is our defensive front. And I, I've got one here today that's been an unbelievable leader that's uh, had a tremendous offseason in Christian Rector. But the big men are controlling our team right now, and that's what you want to see. Um, and that's the best teams that I have been on. Uh, the, the offensive and defensive line have thrived. They control the team, and they've controlled the line of scrimmage. Coach, one of the criticisms, fair or not, mm -hmm. Well, I thought I, I thought the 15 practices that we had in the spring, if everybody was out there, we went to the letter of the law as far as uh, full pad practices, as far as tackle practices, and we'll do the same uh, in training camp. Uh, if you ask our players, I think they'll tell you it's a very physical practice. It's been an extremely tough off season, and it'll be it'll be a very physical training camp. Uh, we'll go to the letter of the law. Uh, the, the I will say this, I will say this, I think every head coach uh, that is smart manages his football team based on where his football team is at. We were very healthy in the spring and it allowed us to be, uh, to be that ultra physicality. Um, and we're in a good position right now to start out that way. Um, you're going to see the opportunity to, to be able to have uh, three scrimmage, scrimmages that we're going to play as close to the vest as games as we can. I can't wait till August 17th to get in that Coliseum and have our fall classic and, and be able to sit there with our fans in the stands, get some performance anxiety, split up into two teams, put the play clock on, and play ball and treat it like an NFL preseason game. Um, that, that's going to be something that I think is good for our team and garners some experience for some young kids. Uh, if that's not physical, if that's not challenging, I don't know what is. Um, but we're going to go uh, use every opportunity we can to get better. Thanks for right. that question.